We know that 15,000 soldiers have been killed, but we also learn that there's a view that Putin wants a land grab before he can ever consider peace. What's your optimism level as of today, James Heapy, about the state of the war? I think I probably am quite optimistic. Uh, I think that the uh, the initial phase has clearly not gone as Russia intended, so much so that they have been required to do a complete rethink on their strategic objectives. It's clear that their new strategic objective is a much more limited uh, incursion to try to secure the entire Donbass, uh, so both the Luhansk and Donetsk uh, oblasts. Um, and uh, you know, if if the Kremlin were willing to stay out of it and leave it to their military planners to design and then execute that campaign, I would be concerned that um, Russia still has a, a an overwhelming firepower that the Ukrainians would be up against it to hold off. But the reality is that as we've seen in so much of the war so far, Putin can't resist interfering in the military planning and his obsession with having this done and dusted by the 9th of May is forcing the pace of the Russian uh, advance into the Donbass so that battle groups that have been moved from Kyiv have not been properly refurbished. They're not massing uh, their forces before they, uh, before they start their offensive. And as a consequence, I think that the Ukrainians could well see them off. And if you look at Mariupol alone, there's you know, a few hundred Ukrainian, I think a few thousand Ukrainian fighters remaining in the Avastar steel works. Three weeks ago, when I was last the government spokesman in the morning, we were worried that Mariupol might fall that day. They fight on and they're absorbing huge amounts of Russian power in the do so in, in, in doing so. So I, I, I actually think, to be honest, there's every chance that the Ukrainians could well defeat Russia in the Donbass. Do you feel, on reflection, that, that they could have done more, they could have done this with less loss of life if we'd have armed them more in the 2010s? There's a sense that's been reported in a couple of papers, including the Sunday Times, that we had opportunities in the 2010s and we didn't take them because, in our view, diplomatically, Putin was someone to be tamed or someone we could have a relationship with. We, we didn't arm the Ukrainians as early as we could have done. Do you think that's a fair criticism? To a degree, yes. I mean, I think the Prime Minister has already said that he thinks that, you know, we probably made a mistake after uh, the Crimea. And I say we collectively as the West rather than the UK specifically, um, that we made a mistake in in uh, in reacting to Crimea in the way that we did. Um, but I think the UK should also reflect that we were one of the leaders in the time from 2014 to 2022 in training the Ukrainians, uh, we made the earliest decision really to provide them with the military aid we thought they'd need for the defense. Um, so yeah, if you were to go back through history, you could reflect that um, that we should have reacted differently to the uh, to the annexing of Crimea. Um, but, you know, the UK probably has uh, a clearer conscience than, than many others. Um, what about an idea that's put forward by General Philip Breedlove, a US military advisor, uh, that the, the war is now very focused in the east of, uh, of Ukraine, the Donbass uh, region. His, his idea is that we should establish an NATO forward base in West Ukraine to better support that fight in the east. Would you ever consider that as a notion and, and, and supporting that in NATO? Yeah, I mean, look, absolutely. I mean, there is a Ukraine is a sovereign country and the Ukrainian government still has a sovereign right to have whoever it wishes into its country. Now, I think that whilst there are active combat operations within Ukraine, we're still in the same place as the discussion that you and I were having maybe kind of two or three months ago at the start of this around why NATO and the West should avoid being actively involved so that it doesn't escalate and become a European war. But if we reach a point where the conflict starts to freeze, on or around the line of control in the Donbass, I think it very likely that we will get very quickly back to where we were prior to February 2022, where everywhere else in Ukraine other than the Donbass, the West was very present and involved in arming and training the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, there are reports of Ukrainian strikes on fuel depots in Russia. There have been a couple of these actually over the last month. Do we as a country support Ukrainians' right to actually take the attack onto Russian territory? Of course we do. I mean, uh, the, the the fact is that Ukraine is a sovereign country that was living peacefully within its own borders. And then another country decided to violate those borders and bring 130,000 troops uh, across into their country. 
that started a war between Ukraine and Russia. And in war, uh, Ukraine needs to strike into its opponent's depth to attack its logistics lines, its fuel supplies, uh, its ammunition depots. And that's part of it. So, look, I, I clearly regret all loss of life, be it military or civilian, and where the actions are indiscriminate from whichever side, the UK government will call it out. But it's completely legitimate for Ukraine to be targeting in Russia's depth in order to disrupt the logistics that if they weren't disrupted, would directly contribute to death and carnage on Ukrainian soil. Could they use British ordnance at all to do that? Is there any concern that any of the weapons we've given them for defensive purposes get used in that? Would that cause any problems? Well, I think it is uh, certainly the case that things that the international community are now providing uh, to Ukraine have the range to uh, to be used over the borders, but that's not uh, you know, that that's not necessarily a, uh, a a problem. I think you know there are lots of countries around the world that operate kit that they have imported from other countries, and when when those when those bits of kit are used, you tend not to blame the country that manufactured it. You blame the country that fired it. Now Ukraine is targeting what I would say are completely legitimate military targets um, to disrupt Russian logistics supplies. And you know the fact is that they make those choices, just as the Russians um, make the choices to indiscriminately bomb Ukrainian towns and cities. Uh, the story is emerging of Sweden and Finland making their decision in May and announcing at the same time about a desire to join NATO. Could we say confidently that the world is a safer place with Sweden and Finland within NATO? Well, look, I mean, NATO... I, for, for, for what, 70 years, NATO has existed and Sweden and Finland have not felt the need to join NATO, even though they were immediately adjoining a USSR that at times was incredibly belligerent. Putin has managed to change the conversation in the course of the last six months to such a degree that they are now considering it. Now, whether, whether they will whether uh, whether NATO and that's for people to discuss at the Madrid summit. And first and foremost, it's for um, colleagues in Helsinki and Stockholm to work out whether they want to do it. But you know, if Putin looks at the Euro-Atlantic security situation and sees a resurgent NATO renewed in purpose and with countries across Europe, north and south, wanting to join NATO when they hitherto haven't wanted to, he should reflect that that is entirely a consequence of his belligerence. James Heapy, good to speak to you today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Dick. Thank you. That's James Heapy there, the Armed Forces Minister. Uh -huh.